So welcome to NIP AA session C. Uh, by the agenda, we will have one and a half hour for this session with two invited talks and one paper presentation. So you're encouraged to ask questions by Q&A system or ordering directly. Okay, first of all, I would like to ask whether there are some uh, remaining questions from session B and session A. Okay, I hear no. So if you have, uh, please type in the chat window. Uh, let's start. Fortunately, we have full of time uh, in this session. Okay, the first invited talk is from Adrian Federal. Uh, Adrian is an uh, innovator and the standard maker who has led the invention of several key technologies in the ITF and who went on to serve as ITF routing area director for six years. Uh, he first got involved in, with the ITF work with standardization of MPLS over 20 years ago. He was one of the uh, pioneers of generalized MPLS and went on to co-chair the ITF C-Camp uh, -Camp working group. And later he contributed to the development of Pass computation element, or say PCE, and co chair the layer one VPN and PCE uh, working groups. He was the ITF liaison to the ITUT on optical networking and also co chairs the layer two and three VPN service model and interface to network security functions working group. Is the co author of over 80. ITF RFCs uh, is a technical advisor uh, to the ITF T's working group and currently serves as the independent submission RFC editor. He has written, edited, or contributed to nine books on internet technologies, including the internet and the its protocol, and the GMPLS architecture and applications. So currently, Adrian runs a successful consulting company, Old Dog, specializing uh, uh, in internet protocols, SDN and NFV. He has also published four volumes of uh, fairy stories for adults of all ages. Uh, unfortunately, I found only three of them on Amazon. So today it's the pleasure for an IP AA workshop to invite him to giving a talk on the new requirement being placed on IP networks. The topic is using IP to entrepin 5G networks, making the unreliable reliable. Welcome, Adria. Uh, thank you. And uh, while I share my screen, I will avoid having a, a discussion about how wonderful Amazon is and uh, how difficult it is to persuade them to stock your books. Um, Right, so um, yeah, I, I'm going to talk a, a bit about um, why IP is used to underpin 5G networks and what pressures that puts on making what was an unreliable protocol uh, behave in reliable ways. Uh, so uh, I'm going to run through uh, some background uh, on what it is we're trying to achieve before um, getting into uh, a discussion of um, what we might do about that, uh, what approaches have already been taken, uh, what the problems are with the architecture and deployment of um, changes to IP, <clears throat> and finish off by uh, looking at how we evaluate whether to evolve uh, or have a revolution in, in our protocols. So what's new? Um, uh, 5G has come along with a huge amount of uh, pizzazz and hype and excitement in the industry. But I think a lot of the things we're talking about are not specific to 5G. It's all about providing new services on the internet. And 5G is just a way of making them more broadly available to different people, different devices in different environments. Um, 
So new services have always, always come along and we have to be a little bit careful. We have to look at what the real services are and what the applications are and try to be careful not to use them as an excuse for um, new technology. New technology should enable things and support them. But um, if we invent the technology and then look for the services to use it, we have things a bit back to front. So there's a long list, and it's definitely not a, a complete list of some of these applications and services we're talking about. Um, they are generally things that um, uh, depend on uh, newly emerging technologies, um, but also uh, new ways of users interacting with each other or with the internet. Um, so these new services need new behaviors from the network. Uh, most of these applications demand something bigger, better, stronger, faster from the network, whether that's just more bandwidth or lower delay or less jitter or more separation from uh, the behavior of other services or more reliability, reliability and, and resilience. Um, and many of the applications need more than one of these things out of the list, and some of them need them all. But just remember, this is not a new list. I think from pretty much day one of the internet, people have been saying, but wouldn't it be great if I could push bigger files through faster, or if I could interact with my neighbor um, more quickly or more in real time? So the, these things have um, troubled internet engineers all, all the while. Uh, so a quick uh, reminder of what we mean when we say underlying 5G networks. And, and this, is, this, is, this, this picture um, is a sort of Terry Pratchett reference. And uh, the, the point is that every network you, you make has some underlying technology that is supporting it. And so networks are stacked hierarchically uh, and the term underlay is subjective. But in this context, we care about the connectivity we're providing for our applications. So how do we get data from our application to a server or to another user? And um, what is the technology that is carrying that? Uh, and largely speaking, we want to talk about applications that run over the internet. Uh, many of the applications we talk about run over specialist networks. And in those cases, we can do far more radical things than when we want to carry traffic uh, across common shared infrastructure. So when we're running over the internet, uh, IP being what it is, makes it a prime candidate for us to talk about as an underlay. Uh, and 5G applications um, and network segments then can be connected together, probably over the internet and using IP as the underlay network. So IP, of course, is not perfect. Uh, it was designed for specific things. It's a simple encapsulation and it, uh, its primary intention was to be resilient to changes in the network and, uh, and to errors in the network. And that made it connectionless uh, and best effort. And from IP's point of view, everything else, everything clever happens in other layers. So the lower layers could be more reliable uh, with link layer protection or with uh, diverse uh, paths, uh, with OAM and uh, many clever things. And the higher layers may include retransmission and uh, security and prioritization. 
so IP is sitting in the middle, and uh, and Klaus showed uh, um, the hourglass picture this morning. Uh, despite being at that pinch point, IP is not predictable, not dependable, and not high quality by design. Uh, so how, how have we managed this? How have we actually delivered reliability over the internet? Um, well, we've used underlaying um, technologies like Ethernet and MPLS and OTN, all of which are, are termed transport technologies and have many uh, mechanisms for managing resources and being reliable. <clears throat> They don't provide end-to-end -end quality of service. They provide uh, segment by segment uh, reliability and quality. So to provide predictability over IP, we already have several mechanisms. We have RTP, which has been around forever. And I'm pretty sure we're using RTP at the moment as I talk to you. It helps handle many of the concerns we have, but that's handle them, not reduce them. So it handles packet loss, it doesn't reduce packet loss. Multipass TCP is um, just come out uh, as a standards trap piece of work in the IETF, uh, having been an experiment for more than five years. And this allows us to improve uh, bandwidth and get better throughput by multiplexing or inverse multiplexing with TCP. And then lots of uh, noise and fanfare around QUIC, which uh, has now been around for a while and has seen a lot of standardization effort from the IETF. It's uh, fairly thoroughly deployed and it um, is also handling multiplexing and somewhat reducing latency. And then two other things I want to mention are diffserve and inserve. Um, they were a previous attempt at getting quality of service and reliability and predictability out of IP by, um, in diffserve's case, coloring packets and prioritizing them and in InServe's case, by um, describing traffic flows and then using the signaling protocol to help install information about those flows in the network. DiffServe is used a little bit, but not as substantially as it potentially could be. And we have to wonder to ourselves why, if there's all this need for um, different classes of service, in the internet, why is it used so little? And InServe is barely used at all. So um, I'm seeing increased pressure to make IP predictable, um, make it behave in known ways to help guarantee quality of service. And this tends to drive some form of connection oriented approach. Uh, we had um, RSVP, placing state in routers, and I'm not talking about the MPLS variety here, I'm talking about RSVP as originally invented to work with InServe. And very much more recently, segment routing places state in the packets and the management station in order to achieve um, the, the desired goals, and that is still a connection-oriented approach. So distinct from that, today's discussions are much more about placing flow quality identifiers in the packets and so labeling the packets to say, what are they for? How should they be treated? And then programming the network to handle those packets differently, different queuing, different prioritization, um, reserved resources, et cetera, according to those um, flow qualities. And there are many assumptions behind this. Uh, those include that the network actually does have enough resources to handle the traffic, that there are no bursty behaviors that swamp the network, that the central management can work out how to place the traffic in the network to get it all through at the right quality, and that 
the routers are configurable um, and programmable to do the right thing with these marking schemes. <clears throat> so where do these new uh, ideas, or how will these new ideas actually get themselves installed in the internet? Um, if we're talking about stuff that is below IP, we can do this hop by hop and only require that adjacent nodes need, how to, uh, need to know how to interoperate. Um, although in fact, we usually do this in sort of clusters or islands of nodes. Um, and, and in these cases, the incentive is operational or commercial. So for example, um, a network might upgrade um, the MPLS that, it off, that it's using in order to be more easy to manage, to be able to carry more traffic and to make more money. But this is not about really about what is offered as a service to the user. If we deploy stuff at the IP level, um, this needs all of the routers in an administrative domain to be updated, to be able to talk to each other and do the same thing. Um, and it's actually better and more effective if the whole end-to-end -end path is upgraded, but that's quite hard. And um, it turns out it's remarkably hard to show the incentive for the upgrade. And I think IPv6 is the classic case for this. IPv6 is so old that uh, even I can't remember when it was invented. Uh, and it is only now sort of slightly getting some traction. And, and that basically should tell us that there has to be a real drive for an operator to do a major upgrade in their network. Now, this may be a different story in small and specialist networks, but for the internet, uh, up IP upgrades take a lot of um, thought and effort. And a third way we can deploy new stuff is end to end, either at the application level or in transport. And here, largely speaking, we only have to update the endpoints, and that becomes super easy. Um, while old versions still need to be supported, we can just do software upgrades uh, at the endpoints and suddenly they're running new and clever schemes between them. And here the incentive, well, the operator is not quite so exposed to the incentive. Uh, the incentive is with the OTTs and the application developers, and it allows them to uh, to, to enable additional features and cleverness in their, to, in their products. So something else that Klaus uh, Vela said um, uh, in his talk at the start of the day was that we're not trying to change the speed of light. Uh, and, and seriously, we have to really be aware of this. Uh, he was talking about um, fairly tight machine-to-machine -machine environments. Um, when we look at some of the applications we're talking about that genuinely need to operate over the internet, and remote surgery is a great case. If you want to do battlefield surgery from your home nation, operating on somebody in the battlefield a thousand miles away, they're still going to be a thousand miles away. Uh, and the round trip latency, um, when people talk about one millisecond, means you better be no more than 90 miles apart. Um, so a lot of this has implications for how we architect our networks. And as again, as Klaus was saying, sometimes you can push the processing uh, really close to the devices uh, or even into the devices or the software. And that's actually traditionally how we've handled things like um, live video stream jitter. We've, we've made the video receiver clever and capable of smoothing over. But the, the network architecture is evolving. It's evolving to push uh, bandwidth to the edge and it's 
throwing a lot more bandwidth, sorry, it's evolving to push processing to the edge. It's putting a lot more bandwidth into the networks. And many cases, private bandwidth networks are established um, to um, provide connectivity within a corporation. So in this figure, the micro data center and the major data center may well be operated by the same company, they probably are, and that company may build its own private network using its own fibers and its own switching equipment. And it does not have to worry about other traffic flows or sharing resources. So the micro data center is pushed all the way into the access or even closer to the edge so that as much as possible can be done. But this still doesn't help you if you need low latency across the world. Um, I have a grandson who is very frustrated by trying to play multiplayer um, video games uh, with people in other countries because it just doesn't work largely because of the speed of light. So we've been here before. Um, we have a repeated cycle of concern that the internet will scale, something must be done. Um, we can reserve bandwidth, we can color packets. But each time we've addressed this chiefly by increased capacity at lower cost. That is to say, we've addressed it by putting in more bandwidth, more bandwidth in the core and more bandwidth to the edge. Um, so we must try to understand why is this different this time? Why is the solution not simply more capacity? Then we have to decide, do we try to fix IP or do we build a replacement? Do we evolve or do we have a revolution? Um, both of them have deployment challenges. Uh, so maybe given the new architecture, maybe we do neither of these things. Maybe what we could do is improve the underlay and the overlay and say IP is what it is. It's an encapsulation. And that makes me think that clearly we need to spend more time on research. We need to understand what it is we're really trying to do. In other words, rather than floating ideas about, hey, one day we might have um, haptic holographic conference facilities, we should be looking at, yeah, but what is it we could actually be doing now? Or, or what are we only a couple of years away from? And then we have to understand what we can already achieve using mechanisms we already know about. What have we learned from protocols we already have? Uh, how could we build on that knowledge and get improvements? Uh, something that definitely needs research is what we can do with better operations and management. How can we plan our networks better? How can we operate them better to spot problems coming up? And there's a lot of machine learning being applied to um, telemetry from the network to predict uh, issues and faults and congestion and handle them preemptively. We need research on how we can design our applications to handle network effects. Uh, and as I said already, we, we do that. We've done that for years. Uh, and there is a temptation, I think, to build an application without thinking about what the network does and then say, Here's our application, we need the network to be better. Well, maybe we should design our applications based on how the network currently behaves. And then we'll have such great applications that when the network does get better, the applications will be even better. So what does research actually require? It requires thought about all these things 
it does require experimentation with protocols and implementations, building open source, pushing them around, running them um, in labs, running them on private networks, uh, maybe even running them uh, on the internet in controlled ways. It definitely needs quantitative measurement uh, of network behavior. Um, we should not be floating this stuff purely theoretically. We need to build it and measure it. And we need to um, conduct that research uh, the way we always have done in universities and in corporate research labs. And we need to publish, 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 publish journals, conferences like this, um, and uh, discussion at the, I, uh, the Internet Research Task Force. So that's me in, uh, oh dear, four minutes short, um, which gives you some time for questions, I think. Okay. Possibly. Uh, okay. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, any comments and questions for uh, the first live talk? Uh, I, I would like to ask the first question from my side. So uh, in your presentation, that uh, you mentioned that both of the evolution and the revolution method has deployment uh, challenges. Uh, could you please give uh, more details uh, on both of these two, two uh, uh, deployment, uh, how to say, deployment model or deployment uh, method, what 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 are the challenges for this? Two? Yeah, so um, let's take uh, revolution first because that's an easier one to uh, to explain, and we can use as our uh, simple example the. Um, progress from IPv4 to IPv6. So initially, uh, hardware was manufactured to only be able to handle IPv4 addresses because that's all there was. So silicon just handled IPv4 addresses and of course all the software was only IPv4 capable. When IPv6 came along, it was relatively easy to upgrade all of the software to support IPv6. But that didn't get us anywhere because the deployed hardware could only handle the shorter addresses. So to get us to the state of being able to handle IPv6, we actually needed to physically upgrade every router in the network. Now, over time, of course, all routers are manufactured supporting V4 and V6, and they gradually get rolled out and replace what's in the field. But um, if we want to make rapid progress, we actually we can't wait for 20 years for everything to be re reach end of life and be replaced. We have to go out and replace it all. So that's revolution. Evolution is taking smaller steps. It's saying, uh, what about, what if I added this little piece of behavior? Uh, so maybe with a protocol, I make use of existing fields in the protocol that aren't used. Uh, and maybe I add management tools to push the, uh, the control instructions into the network. But I still need my routers in the network to be capable of handling that. So that's at least software upgrades. Uh, and possibly we need routers that are cleverer and do special queuing behaviors. And those are hardware upgrades. And now it's oh, it looks very much like revolution again. OK, thank you, Adrian. Uh, I would like to check with the uh, Q&A window. Uh, is there any other comments or questions from the participants? Uh, you can directly uh, ask question. Yeah, Alex Gallis from University College London. Uh, Please. Very good, 
good uh, definition of the problem space. However, a bit short in how to move forward, given the fact that this is an old problem of making a bigger, faster, and so on internet. Uh, specific two questions. Do you believe that IR, IETF is still good at making this happen, bearing in mind that IETF is very narrowly minded in terms of creating protocols, specific protocols, and not something which is frameworks dealing with many subjects, which are needed to cover this bigger topic? That's one question. And the second is, it looks to me that uh, in trying to integrate uh, better management operation with uh, forwarding, uh, also addressing and routing, uh, that requires a bit of uh, resync. Uh, and uh, where do you believe that the uh, main issue lies here? Is it just... Uh, to carry on as it is you're suggesting, namely to be careful not to disturb what is now and keep going and improving, or there is a substantial need to look at this uh, big issue and try to uh, research it, obviously, but also put it in place. These are the two questions. Yeah, uh, ciao, Alex. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of deliberately didn't um, talk about how do we make this work uh, because I wanted to to level set, um, but you're, I think you're right in your questions. Um, so the IETF is an engineering organisation, primarily focused on fixing short-ish term problems. Um, so that may be anything from. Uh, the internet is broken today, we have to fix it tomorrow, up to um, within the next three years, we need to be building and deploying this. Um, the IETF is less good when it's trying to look at longer term problems, basically <clears throat> because the, uh, the commercial imperative is not there. The IRTF, is um, a place for people to bring their research, discuss it and get ideas for the next research. So it's not actually a place where the research is done per se. Um, and that leaves us with, with um, a sort of bigger question, where do we do the research? And I, I, I tried to answer that by saying, we do the research exactly where we've always done it which is in research facilities with the people who are good at research, and then they can bring their results and share them and we can learn the lessons. Uh, and then you asked as your second question about um, whether the integration of better management uh, systems and maybe more aware management systems with the existing routing infrastructure requires a bit of a rethink. Uh, and I think it does a bit. There is some work going on at the moment um, that is in the IETF about uh, collecting telemetry, which is great, but the architecture is a bigger picture. What do you do with that telemetry once you've got it? How do you process it? How do you push that back into the way that you operate the network? Um, that, uh, that sort of closed loop. And I, I'm aware of many research projects on that. But what we probably need is an understanding for the operators, the network operators, of what the benefits would be. So we need that research to actually go a little bit further and give some quantitative results on if we do these things, this is the improvement we're able to get in the network. Okay, I appreciate for the question and answers. And uh, uh, is there any more questions for Adrian? 
Uh, if no, uh, let's start the next topic. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Uh, appreciate it for your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next presentation is from Gao Zheng uh, Surrey University. Gao has received a PhD degree in inform uh, informatics from King's College London in 2019. And uh, he is currently a research fellow with 5GIC University of Surrey. His research interest includes future internet technologies, network function and virtualization, information-centric network, mobile age computing, and space terrestrial network. So today he will give a presentation on geosynchronous network rate addressing for integrated space terrestrial network. Welcome, Gao. Hi. You may share your screen. Okay, please. Can see it. All right. Uh, hello, guys. Like, uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. So, a uh, very interesting talk from Adrian. We have the similar consideration about how we should treat IP in the future. So, in this work, we also try to take a balance between like evolution and revolution. Yeah, so uh, today I'm going to present our work on behalf of my colleagues. And the title of th this work is uh, Geosynchronized Network Grid Addressing for Integrate Space Terrestrial Networks. Uh, so uh, I'll start by uh, introducing the background of the work. And next, we'll explain the uh, Geosynchronized Network Grid Addressing Scheme. This includes the uh, basic idea of the scheme, the design details, and how the network can be with the GenJS game. And um, follows that, um, we show the simulation results in the uh, uh, performance evaluation section. And last, we'll summarize the findings in the conclusion section. So now let's move to the um, first section. Uh, in the last few years, countries like US, China, and EU has, have uh, successfully uh, brought space terrestrial network integration into their international strategic plans. So under this background, building a global covered, fast, reliable, uh, heterogeneous network, which consists of uh, geo, mil, and leo satellites, as well as the existing terrestrial networks has received increasing interest. Uh, especially the research interest on uh, LEO satellite integration schemes has dramatically increased recently since SpaceX has uh, continuously launched its LEO satellites with authorization granted from the US Federal Communication Committee aiming to create a natural in-space IP network such that like future network applications, for example, uh, IOTs in the space, caching, uh, edge computing from the sky becomes available. Uh, however, uh, achieving these goals requires addressing new challenges. So one of the key challenges is the uh, satellite terrestrial routing stability problem. So in general, a LEO satellite travels at a uh, velocity of 7.8 kilometers per second, which is much faster than the rotation speed of Earth. So as a result, directly uh, integrating the LEO satellite network using the legacy IP routing suit, for example, like BGP, will be faced with the routing stability problem. For example, um, the figure below shows what will happen if BGP is directly uh, implemented for integration. So we know that in a traditional TCP IP network, the network address is bound to the devices, right? Then when the satellite moves away, it will carry 
the uh, this IP address with it and the function built upon it. So in this case, the ground station will soon lose the BGP connection with the satellite on top. And if the incoming satellite is using a different IP address, the ground station will mismatch its BGP parameters with the new satellites. And as a result, routing stability becomes a problem as a massive updating events will be propagated into uh, the internal routing infrastructures. So to circumvent this problem, a recent integration attempts have proposed to integrate the satellites in different ways. So in general, the solutions can be uh, classified into three categories. Uh, the first one is using satellites uh, as an independent network. Uh, in this category, the space and terrestrial network will use uh, different routing and adjusting paradigms. However, in this kind of uh, integration schemes, uh, additional header will be applied to when the packet uh, transmitted, transmitting across the uh, space and territorial network border. And the second category uses satellite as the access network, uh, such, as, uh, such, <clears throat> such that routing is not performed at the, uh, uh, at the space and territorial network border. However, uh, it lacks a comprehensive view on the communication itself and data transmission need to rely on the terrestrial network. So which even applies to the scenario where the two communication ends are with the same satellite, right? And the last uh, category use satellites as the transmit network, but they usually consider different network architecture instead of the mainstream of whole by hope uh, IP routing philosophy. So to the best of our knowledge, none of the <clears throat> pure works have fundamentally uh, eliminate the routing stability problem. So thus the goal of this work is to seemingly uh, integrate the space and terrestrial network based on a unified common IP infrastructure with, but without introducing severe uh, routing stability caused by the Leo satellite constellation behaviors, especially considering the legacy routing infrastructure on the terrestrial network side. And ideally the uh, design implementation scheme shall be uh, implementation friendly. Uh, to this end, we developed the geosynchronized network grid adjacent scheme, and we call it GNGA for the rest of the presentation. So let's have a look at the basic idea of GNGA. Um, since the cause of foundation of information, the satellite terrestrial routing stability problem is that IP addresses are designed to be bound to the devices, which is satellites in our case. Then like, why not try to decouple the IP addresses from the satellites and bend them to some fixed fix, such that the satellite ground station mobility is bypassed and the legacy IP routing scan can be reused. Thus the basic idea of GNGA is to artificially create a static uh, space network for the terrestrial networks. To achieve that as shown um, in the figure, we divide the uh, space into grids and the grids are designed to be geosynchronized. Uh, we utilize this geosynchronized grid to build this base network system. And especially uh, each grid is by logic, a virtual router in this system. And the virtual routers are consecutively instantiated by the passing by satellites. So thereby the advantage of such design is obvious that from the ground stations 
uh, as bad. The virtual rotors, that's the speed, uh, that's the grid, are static. And by such a design, uh, topology dynamic caused by satellite mobility is hide from the IP layer. So here are some uh, design details to guarantee the, <coughs> sorry, to guarantee the grids are geosynchronized, we use a uh, geographic coordinates to divide to, to divide the grids. So for example, the uh, square showed in this figure provides an uh, instance of such a uh, geosynchronized network grid. So as discussed before, for the GNJ scheme, we decoupled IP address from the devices and the IP address is bound to the grid instead of the satellites. And accordingly, um, in the proposed GNJ scheme, each ground station now only talks to a fixed piece of sky above it and wait for the passing by satellites to consecutively instantiate the IP function of this grid. Uh, here we pro provide an example of uh, instanting the uh, network grid with uh, satellites. Uh, please notice that like unlike the traditional design, the configuration in our context is grill based. Uh, that's to say for uh, each network grill, it has a corresponding uh, configuration. Okay, for example, network grid and network, network grid one and network grid two are instantiated by uh, satellite one and two respectively in this case. And as can be seen from the figure, um, grid two has uh, three virtual interfaces and each virtual interfaces is assigned with an IP address. Uh, satellite two in this case should configure the uh, this in IP addresses to its corresponding uh, interfaces and especially the downlink interface towards the uh, ground station that is like uh, its physical address 2AAAA is mapping to 2.2.2.2 to establish the EBGP connection with the terrestrial peer. And later when uh, satellite one enters network grid two to take over the job of satellite two, it will configure its interface based on the configuration of GNG2, for example, like for the next moment, 1AAAA shall now map to uh, 2.2.2.2. So uh, of course the configuration inclu includes uh, more than just uh, IP address, it could include uh, other settings, for example, like uh, BGP settings. And that is to say, a satellite will need to uh, activate the right configuration before it enters a grid. And we call this uh, process the setting coordination. Uh, <clears throat> since for each network grid, there's a configuration and for a satellite, it needs to adjust its configuration uh, when entering a new grid. That's to say a satellite will need to periodically shift its settings uh, during a mission. So in this work, we describe two configuration shifting options. One is called uh, active shifting and the other is called uh, passive shifting. For active shifting, a satellite will be proactively configured we will be con uh, proactively configured with all the configurations of the grills that it will be passing during its mission, right? And since the satellite mobility is highly predictable, so a satellite can mount the right configuration based on the timeline or the location information, for example, at 12 o'clock, the satellite could mount the configuration of grid one and 
<clears throat> at one o'clock p.m., it will switch to the configuration of grid two, right? And besides, the satellite will need to advertise the latest ARP mapping to the network such that other devices can know how to forward the packets to that group. For example, uh, at the first moment, uh, the satellite will advertise IP 1.1 mapping to its physical uh, address 1AAA. And for the next moment, you will need to send out the ARP information of uh, two, uh, IP 2.1 is mapping to 1AAA. Uh, while for uh, passive shifting, a satellite will need to uh, pass the configuration of the grid to its successor. So uh, as can be seen from the figure, uh, it, the satellite moves towards the left-hand side. And before it moves out of a grid, it will need to pass the configuration to the uh, to you pass its configuration of this grid to the next satellite. Uh, well, in this case, the satellite does not need to carry the full configuration at all time, which is different from uh, the active shifting. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, next let's have a look at how the packets are transmitted uh, with GNGs. So in GNGA, the packets are transmitted hole by hole, just like IP between the uh, network grids. And to leave the current satellite communication system unchanged to the largest extent, we adopted the, we adopt the uh, satellite addressing and routing suit for the MAC layer. So in short, we use IP for routing, while we use satellite address for switching. Thereby, the path lookup and packet forwarding process will look very similar to the classic system. So, for example, if a user end uh, on the plane wants to communicate with a set of, uh, terrestrial server, it will generate a packet uh, as shown here. So, the packet will be forwarded based on the routing tables of the satellites on the path. Uh, so in our case, the destination is x.1. So based on the routing table, the next hope is going to be 4.1, right? Which is <clears throat> being instantiated by this satellite and the packet is sent hole by hole to the ground station. And for illustration purpose, the figure only shows the routing tables for the current moment. But notice that as uh, discussed in the last slide, when the JG is uh, instantiated by a new satellite, the satellite will advertise the latest ARP information. For example, when this satellite moves out of this grid, the satellite in the middle will take over the uh, will take over the this grid and the satellite on the left, which is this one, will take over the grill in the middle. So for the next moment, the layer two address of 4.1 becomes uh, 1A. So everybody knows now uh, grill, this grill is instantiated by this satellite, uh, thereby the communication is uh, guaranteed. So to verify if the GNG concept works, we conduct a set of simulations uh, on a small scaled network as shown in this table. Uh, the satellite network uses um, static routing while the uh, terrestrial network uses uh, OSPF and the IGPs are redistributed into BGPs. And the simulation network consists of like five full mesh terrestrial networks and three uh, GNGs. The GNGs are respectively instantiated by three satellites 
uh, shares the same ring orbit. Uh, so the number of terrestrial and space prefixes are 10 and 3 respectively. So for the uh, configuration options, we select the active shifting, uh, that is a JAX and protocol configurations are made uh, <laughs> actively and each satellite carries the configurations of all the grids. Uh, so just like this one. Um, the ground station always talk to uh, network group one with 14.002 as its BG, as its eBGP uh, address when satellite one leaves uh, network grid one, satellite two will enter it. So we define this as a handover event. Uh, and without loss of uh, generality, we define two handover types. So uh, for the first one, we call it a smooth handover. Mm. <clears throat> for smooth handover, the ground station always make the connection with the new satellite before it breaks the connection with the old satellite. And for, this, for the next option, we have a hard handover. So for hard handover, the ground station will lose the connection with the old satellite before it has made the connection with the new satellite. Then it is interesting to know if a handover event will cause the connectivity loss for the GNG scheme. And if so, how much uh, impact will be triggered per mobility uh, per handover event. Uh, this figure shows the um, network connectivity performance of GNG scan compared to the uh, BGP straightforward scan under different uh, handover types. So in this figure, connectivity being one uh, means the uh, space and terrestrial network can perform normal communication with each other. So for handovers, as can be seen from the figure, uh, even with a small topology, the uh, BGP straightforward approach will require approximately 30 seconds to converge, but uh, GNGA can recover instantly after the um, handover event. While for the uh, smooth handover uh, scenario, GNG can achieve seamless communication. While the BGP uh, straightforward approach would need a 10 second path switching time. So what is this uh, path switching time? Uh, for smooth handovers, um, sorry, for smooth handovers, because of the uh, make before break feature, uh, there will be a small period when two links are coexisting. Uh, between the ground station and the overhead uh, satellite. So in this case, for many uh, BGP instances, due to the route uh, flapping prevention consideration, they would prefer the earliest learned path, which is the path with the old satellite. Thus, it will take some time for the ground station to switch the forwarding path from the old satellite to the new one. So that uh, is our uh, path switching time. Okay, so let's have a look at the uh, handover impacts. So um, as shown in the figure for GNJ handover will not trigger any uh, prefix update propagating into both the space and terrestrial infrastructures. While for the BGP uh, straightforward, uh, approach, the number of update entities propagating into space and uh, in, into ground and space are night and 97, uh, respectively. And the uh, corresponding uh, number with smooth handovers are 105 and 150. 
So that's to say a smooth handover will check a smooth handover will trigger more of the events propagating into both this space and terrestrial network. But why smooth handover will trigger more of the event? So this is also because of the, because this is also because of the uh, coexistence of the new and old uh, ground station satellite links. Uh, so for like each time when a new link is made, the, so each time when a new link is made, um, the, how should I put this to get it easier to understand? So uh, the new link will take, so, okay. So each time when the new link is made, the new link will be taken as a uh, candidate path for the existing purposes. And the uh, related updates in this case will be propaganda into this uh, terrestrial and space uh, network. And this- uh, go, Excuse yeah. me, uh, sorry for interrupt uh, the talk uh, because we have uh, limited time for this session. So could you please uh, finish I'll, the I'll done, uh, presentation uh, in five minutes? Yeah, okay, could you? Thank you. So yeah, so the similar protocol behaviors will perform again uh, when, the great, uh, when, when, when the ground station lost the uh, connection with the formal satellites. But for the hard handover, because there's only one uh, ground, sta uh, ground station satellite links at a time, Thus, uh, updates are only triggered by the connection and disconnection events rather than by the path selection as well. So for smooth handover, you will have some uh, uh, update events related to uh, path switching events. So uh, as a result of thought, uh, Smooth handover can circumvent the convergence issue for BGP, but it is not free, so it will trigger more uh, update events uh, in this case. So <clears throat> in summary, uh, in this work, we develop a novel uh, geosynchronized network grid adjacent scheme to integrate the LEO satellites and terrestrial satellites based on a unified common IP infrastructure. Uh, the proposed game is tested via uh, simulations and the results suggest that uh, GNG is a competitive solution for space territorial network integration. So with GNG, we, uh, the topology dynamic is high from the IP layer. The network connectivity performance is significantly improved uh, the uh, integration impact is small to the existing terrestrial uh, system. And considering all the incremental changes are made from the uh, space segment, thus is considered as uh, implementation friendly since it is still a very early stage for uh, the space to integrate the IP network. So, uh, okay. All right, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, if you have any question, please feel free to ask. Hello. Go. Hi. I see you online. Uh, can't hear you clearly. It's a little bit laggy here now. Okay. So Sen, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes, Carl, we can hear you. I think Yan Shen okay. has some problem with his connection. All and right. excellent, yeah, excellent talk. Uh, while have well, I while I have your attention, did you consider setting up the configuration tables just as a factor of time because uh, it's pretty much predictable when each satellite will be in a grid. So all you need is just one line of configuration that changes with the time. So you mean like this part, right? Yeah. Uh, so you consider to say, okay, proactively configure just one configuration carrying all the time. Yeah. And just depending upon the time uh, at a given, um, the current time, you know where your satellite is. Yeah, which is possible, but uh, <clears throat> but if you consider this, it will have no difference saying that like we carry three uh, configuration at the same time because the size of the the configuration size of what you mentioned is like super huge. In that case, the the problem here is like if we always have the configuration carry on the satellite. Uh, then the utility rate of this configuration will be very low. So, um, <clears throat> so there will be like two options here. So you can suffer it from like low uh, utility, let's say uh, configuration utilities, uh, but you can always have the configuration so you don't have very difficulty to switch between the configurations. Or the other option is that, okay, you have to send this uh, com uh, configurations over the network, but the problem is, yeah, but, but the benefit is that you can achieve high, let's say, uh, utility from the configuration. I uh, hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, cheers. Uh, okay, is it, uh, since the time <coughs> limitation, uh, let's go to the next uh, talk. I appreciate uh, for Gao's uh, presentation very, very clear and uh, very novel and interesting topic. Thank you, Gao. Yeah, yes. Uh, should I stop sharing yeah. now? Yeah, please. Yeah, okay, good. So, uh, okay, the second and the final uh, invite talk in session C is from Future Way, uh, Tourist Eckert and Stewart Bryant. The topic is unified forwarding plan for enhanced services. So, Tourist is a uh, distinguished engineer at FutureWay USA, where he is working on the long-term evolution of networks. Uh, Torres has broad experience in distri uh, distributed system and uh, network technologies, including layer two, routing, QS, multicast, application integration, and uh, automation. He has been working for more than 30 years for public research organization and uh, commercial vendors in roles that including planning, building, and operating networks. And Stewart is uh, also a distinguished engineer consultant to Future Bay USA and uh, a visiting professor at the University of Surrey, UK. He is specialist uh, uh, in the in internet routing system and is an author on 32 ITF RC and an inventor of over 80 patents in this area. Okay, welcome Torres and Stewart, please. Thank you, Jan. Uh, I, I hope my uh, slides are shared correctly. I can't see my own video. Uh, very so. clear. Okay. I'm not sure if my uh, video is fine, but let's get started. Um, so I hope you read the abstract. Um, so this uh, talk is a little bit in the line of what Adrian was talking about, but uh, looking more specifically into the services and what I would call a, uh, an elephant in the room, which is the fact that we're really having, you know, multi-layered networks. Um, and um, so this is ongoing work. It's meant to inspire attendees to think about this area, um, but no actual work results will be presented. Um, so yeah, 25 years ago about, uh, we went from IPv4 to IPv6 and, you know, I'm a card carrying or t-shirt wearing member of, and all we got are more addresses. So there were a lot of really good foundational uh, improvement to the network layer goals in the IP next generation effort in the early 90s and almost none of them were adopted to IPv6. So fundamentally, we're really talking about a 50 year old uh, IPv4 protocol and its services with uh, more addresses. So then the question really is what future 
IP evolutions do we need, right? So is it IPv6 forever? Is it a new IP? And I think we'll never know until we explore the options and compare them. And, you know, the ITF may best be in uh, very small, incremental, very slow uh, extensions to IPv6 based on the law of IPv6, which is RFC 8200. And research uh, would, I think, be very well advised to look into better options for packet headers without these RFC 8200 uh, constraints. And then really compare, and I think we already know from past experience in the industry, that uh, we ultimately may end up with a preppy backdropping of research results into you know, existing protocols to make a migration better. But um, I think that it's way too early to uh, come to those conclusions. So when we're talking about you know, the services and network layer services, really we're talking about hop by hop services across multiple layers. So it applies to layer two, layer 2.5, three and 3.5 where we're looking into transport protocols and improving them. Right, and the definition of services uh, really for me are functions in the forwarding plane that may happen on every hop and are indicated and desired by the endpoints and impact and differentiate the traffic experience in an absolute or relative fashion uh, versus other traffic. So if that's too abstract, let's uh, quickly explain with an example. The most widely deployed, you know, hop by hop functionality in network is traffic steering. Uh, today, uh, the most popular version of that is source routing. It's widely used in service provider networks with uh, technologies like SRMPLS or SRV6 or even others. Um, and it's uh, used primarily there for capacity optimizations, right? So the networks have a variety of path and you need to utilize all of them and you achieve that with that traffic steering. So now that alone is just a function, a hop by hop uh, function, but not a hop by hop service because it doesn't meet requirements two and three. So the user doesn't care, he doesn't differentiate. But if we would add to this, for example, the ability for the user to say, well, you know, I don't want to get the best throughput that I get through your capacity optimization, but I want to get lowest latency. And that, for example, could be another steering policy, right? So you, you could steer across shortest path with the metric being latency. Right, so then basically that steering becomes the hop by hop part of a network layer service. So what do we have as IP service today? And so this is a, in more detail what, what Adrian was already talking about. So basically all services that IP networks will ever need really must fit into eight bits. Oh, wait a second. No, it's actually six bits because we reduced the TOS field um, to six bit DSCP, which is really the diff surfer code point now, and there are two bits left for congestion control as one specific service, uh, which is the ECN um, field, right? So then there is an addition, of course, INSERF, the integrated services, and as Adrian said, that has not been widely deployed, but we're seeing, you know, I think a lot of pressure to figure out again what to do with it because of the DEF networking group in the IETF, which in itself is trying to bring the layer two TSN services to the layer three IP and MPLS world and has done so far only, you know, partially in the forwarding plane for MPLS, but not for IP, right? So really we're talking about no fundamental recent standard improvement of this 25 to 50 year old framework, right? So DSCP kind of came in 25 years ago about, but um, TOS of course came with IP before. Um, so we're really in deployment are talking about class-based uh, traffic management, which isn't even deployed in the internet, only in controlled networks. So it's really dismal. So what's our vision for, you know, how to indicate IP services in the forwarding plane? And so here at the page is showing the what, the, sorry, the how, and, and we're calling that the contract header. And that's basically the idea how to rethink the encoding and programming of services packet headers uh, with the aspects that go beyond, you know, our typical, you know, uh, 25 to 50 year old IP extension headers with their TLVs. So we've come up and um, built out um, the ability to express services through actions with parameters. We have additional metadata that are shared data elements, not tied to individual actions, but usable for all of them. There's explicit indication of sequentialization and parallelization of actions. Um, and then there are basically, in the end, multiple encoding options for the same functional outcomes to optimize for space or performance. And uh, foremost, and the most important part is the concept of statelets, which allows us to distinguish between, you know, 
um, high cost but high value per flows uh, uh, actions, which are you know similar to what was done um, with RSVP, but with so-called in-band signaling of really you know uh, the setup of the flow um, within the actual data packets, um, something that was experimented on in the IETF several times, but never came to conclusions because of well you know how slowly anything in IP and IPv6 is moving. And then even more so to have a new IP go beyond um, per flow scalability limits, we've been very much looking into per packet services and action elements um, in this header um, because a, a service provider core or metropolitan network would require millions of flows and we know that that is not a feasible approach. So then the how, and we have uh, clustered the majority of the how um, functionalities under our brand high precision communication services. We're really looking into managing um, the key, you know, hop by hop functions, congestion control, throughput loss and latency um, in as much as possible a stateless fashion and going only to statelets uh, where required. Um, and here is, uh, you know, a, um, an example overview of um, possible aspects. I'm not going to go through all of them. Right, so there is a lot of research and congestion control um, that needs further work to figure out how to unify ECN versus PCN, more than two ECN bits, upspeeding indication, and I could go on forever on congestion control. Um, throughput, obviously, they're, they're really interesting uh, past work about providing better than, you know, best effort, like all flows should be equal because we know some flows need more bandwidth. Um, loss. Right, so that's been at the core and center of, for example, DeathNet, uh, Live Live, sequence number indication, flow indications, differentiation between IP and V frames. So there is a lot of, you know, packet indications that would be helpful, have been explored in the past. What we've been focusing on and done research work is latency. Um, and so we've came up with um, something called latency-based forwarding. Uh, there are references uh, to the paper and work we've done um, in, in, in the reference slide. And so that's really the idea to have a fine grained management of latency uh, to distinguish um, different uh, traffic uh, on even a packet by packet basis um, end to end. So there is more, um, I'm going to skip this slide, right? So, so this is not the whole set of IP services, but um, really a lot more, um, but uh, these high precision services are the ones that I think are useful to think of when going through the rest of the slide deck. So, most networks are multi-layer and that brings us back to the topic um, and the QS and service action across the different layers vary widely today, um, but they often are you know, similarly limited. Um, so for example, the IP DSCP is comparable to the ethernet uh, class of service and the MPLS EXP bits, um, but they're sufficiently different to make any deployment painful when more than best effort is desired. And you know the mapping is the lowest common denominator, and the main working model is that, you know, um, in doubt you uh, are going to have less of a service at lower layers. And so when we're talking about why networks are multi-layer, let's uh, you know look at the pictures on the right. Right. So you know the abstracted view of an IP network in before the 1990s was that you had hosts, you had uh, local area networks, which was a yellow cable running through the building connected to the host and the routers and everything was hunky-dory except of course you couldn't provide any good QS on the LAN too but uh, since the 90s uh, you know the reality in most controlled networks enterprises federal uh, military industrial manufacturing is that you have a mixture of routers and layer two switches right and so if you then look at where you do the hop by hop action you'll see that you know you have your green layer two Lay, sorry, the green layer three um, hop by hop action. So symbolized with a Q here um, and the same thing in red for layer two. And you of course have, um, you know, exactly the different models of how to do the hop by hop action on them. And that's highly confusing uh, and difficult and really makes it very difficult to get new hop by hop services deployed into these networks. Um, and this is the simple case, right? If we look into uh, metropolitan size networks where there's also MPLS and Ethernet and layer three routing, um, you can really first think about getting out of the business before you're trying to do QS in these type of environments. So what can we do, right? So um, 
it's kind of this this game right ignore eliminate or embrace the multiple layers right and you know ignore is a little bit what we've been doing uh, most of the time for controlled networks right so which is why i think it's the elephant in the room and out of the three options is the one that i would really um like to avoid right um so ip and ipv6 toward hosts require ethernet lands right so separate ipv6 subnets per host are unmanageable in a lot of the networks that i explained um, and IPv6 hosts, uh, subnets with more than one host or more than two routers have the layer two switching, right? Now you think, wait, wait a second, I, I don't even have separate layer two switches, right? I just have integrated layer two and layer three switches. Fine, you have a single box, but if you look at the right-hand side, then the red integrated VLANs in your layer two, layer three box are exactly layer two switches and all the same things that I uh, talked about in the prior slide equally applies here. You have the same complexity just uh, within a single or, you know, redundantly two of these boxes. So how about that ignorance, right? So when we moved from IPv4 to IPv6, we ignored that problem, right? We, we didn't try to overcome the need to do layer two switching in most of um, IP networks, even though CLNP um, in the 80s was showing how to do it, um, you know, with uh, what I always call host routes uh, instead of layer two MAC address tables which was working perfectly fine, but that wasn't, you know, um, adopted for the IPv6 architecture, right? Um, it was adopted uh, later on in new type of networks uh, in a limited fashion, um, but really, you know, with a lot of things that Ethernet um, and IEEE has done better than the ITF, it's really hard to think about uh, eliminating um, Ethernet switching these days, right? So. Some of those IPv6 network architectures that use host routes are uh, IoT networks with radios and the Ripple routing protocol, and then yours truly autonomic control plane uh, that we're currently standardizing in the IETF. So let's think about also the option of embracing the multiple layers, right? And obviously, if we think about a new IP, then for example, the variability of um, addressing uh, would come uh, very nicely into play to think about a new IP um, superseding the functionality of different layers, right? So the layer three instance could be using traditional 128 or 32 bit addresses. A layer two um, uh, replacing instance of the new IP could use 48 bits or maybe for IoT 16 and TLS 20 and so on, right? But if and where we embrace multiple forward layers, you know, how do we deal with the service in their packet headers? So just to reiterate about, you know, eliminate or embrace, right? So I think it's not um, clear. So there will always be cases where embrace is better than eliminate and vice versa. Um, a lot of protocols were designed uh, to do as little as necessary and really use the layering on top of each other as a mean to solve multiple problems at once, right? Um, and really that is working well in a lot of services, but it's really working very badly for the hop by hop services because it means having to reinvent high precision services for each of these layers, right? Um, and typically when this happens today, it's incompatible to each other. Um, <clears throat> and that's duplicating efforts and slowing down adoption of the services, right? Um, and you know, one approach is thinking about uh, coming up with a definition at least of the services that are superset of the hop by hop services required at different layers in a backward compatible interoperable fashion for migration and backlink protection. So let's see, what are we doing today? And uh, on the right hand side, you see uh, the typical headers you'd see today in one of those complex networks, Ethernet, then MPLS, then IP. Each of them has, you know, what you could uh, euphemistically call a contract header, like, you know, um, eight bit of cost, three bits of EXP, um, you know, eight bit of toss. Um, and that's the correct legal dogma approach to do these things. And it comes with all the problems that I mentioned about mapping these things, figuring out uh, the policies at each layer. And then there is the wonderful, you know, pragmatic layer violation case where you're spoofing at a higher layer contract, for example, at the MPLS and at the ethernet header um, looking into the DSCP of the IP header, or even more so, uh, even transport headers. And that is, you know, actively done in a lot of vendor specific and market uh, specific and uh, most often non standardized ways. Um, but of course, uh, given how it's a layer violation, it has never been officially blessed by anything in the ITF. 
So what are better options we could have explored? Um, so we could have new reusable contract headers and that's what I was pointing to um, on the prior slide. Um, so we could support a, a superset of service uh, aspects of existing layers, right? Each layer's instance may just be a drop-in replacement of existing layer contracts for backward compatibility. So we need variable length contract headers where you, know, you can only express the subset of what you need in its instance in this particular layer. Um, and um, in the first place, it just looks like unification. So like you're building a unified platform, you have to develop less code. You, you're reducing the number of protocols you have, which has been very successful even as a, a goal in the IPF. If you look at you know, the, the move to SRMPLS to eliminate things like LD2 or so, um, so just unifying these headers might be a, a very good thing. Um, and this is shown here on the right hand side. So you'd have a new contract header going along with an Ethernet header, uh, another instance going along with an MPLS header, and then finally with an IP header or a new IP header, obviously. Um, and one of the things you get out of it is actually at the different layers, new functionality, meaning um, you could, you know, uh, get the functionality that you previously as a service, like for example, TSN had in an ethernet header immediately get at the IP header without recreating and redefining this like we have done in DeadNet, right? So or, or we haven't even uh, done correctly for the IP header, right? So um, now obviously given how we have three headers, this by itself would not eliminate the mapping between the layers. It could be a one by one mapping now, which makes life a lot easier. Um, but of course we can think beyond this and we can think about a cross layer semantic for a contract header, right? If ultimately we would want to have at each, you know, forwarding hop, whether it's an ethernet hop, an MPLS hop or an IP hop in a, a multi-layer um, uh, network deployment, the same contract, why not have a simple single contract header and figure out, you know, what is the logic to ensure that still each device can accordingly um, forward on the actual layer header that it is interested in. Um, and so this would be, you know, not necessarily something you do when the different layers belong to different operational entities, like a service provider running MPLS carrying a customer's IP traffic. But when you have a single operator, like which is typical in uh, controlled networks running um, all the three layers uh, from one administrative entity. So that would be a really cool way to proliferate new services much easier through a lot of what we consider to be the core uh, target networks. Um, and I think we can learn from the IPv6 and SRV6 experience, right? Because SRV6 was an attempt to reuse the IPv6 protocol at the layer previously occupied by MPLS and SRMPLS, which you know I call the network layer of a service provider, compared to the internet layer, which is where IPv6 uh, for the internet is traditionally run, right? And and this you know approach to reuse IPv6 and extend it for this kind of network layer was challenged by inheriting all the aspects of internet IPv6 into this layer. And that's basically a lot of the constraints from RFC 8200 and all the problems coming with it. Like why the heck do I need 128 bit addresses um, for a network where you know I could get away with 16 bit or 20 bit addresses like we've shown with MPLS, right? And uh, there is a lot more, right? So creating a fully cross layer reusable protocol um, requires more research and experimentation. By the way, experimentation is something that in the past has happened quite widely in the IETF to just follow up on what Adrian has said. So I'm not giving up on doing experimentation in the IETF, but I do agree that initial work is best focused on IRTF um, as, as a way to communicate with that SDO. Right? Separating out QS high precision contract parts and make it reusable maybe a really good first uh, uh, goal, right? Which is why I think uh, focusing on such a contract header, high precision uh, services within it um, seems to be a very good stepping stone towards um, a broader new IP solution. And then replacing the base headers of MPLS, Ethernet IP with common headers with uh, different addresses requires variable length addresses, but also a lot more thought on migration, integration, optimization. So maybe, you know, staging it this way would be a way to get the main benefits of new services across all the layers uh, fastest. So summary and conclusions, multiple hop by hop forwarding layers are common today and important um, 
Sometimes they're beneficial, sometimes undesirable, but unavoidable. In a new IP world, these should be eliminated where not beneficial. A new IP should be able to operate at multiple layers where beneficial. Per hop services are ideally common across per hop forwarding layers. And the contract and service packet headers should ideally be shareable across layers where feasible. Right. So solving these challenges could be a key uh, focus uh, for the success of a new IP. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Um, please reach out to us if you're interested in this topic. The emails are on the title slide. And <coughs> it's a little bit of references, way too little, but uh, to get you started on you know, what our thinking has been and what our you know, um, lookups are. Thank you, Torres. Uh, I just want to check with you uh, whether Stuart uh, will have another presentation. Uh, no, I mean, this was uh, ah, okay. This Thank you. Was, uh, 25 minutes or so, right? Five minutes questions. Am I a little bit too fast? Okay. <laughs> ah, no, we're just on time. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to uh, ask all the participants uh, is there any comments or questions for Torres' presentation? about this, uh, this, to this topic. Uh, if no, because the time has uh, limited, so I would like to close the meeting. Uh, are there any comments, questions? So let me uh, ask let me... from Turles. Yeah, uh, yeah, Kieran, please. Turles, you talked about uh, a single contract to support cross-layering. Do you see any layer violation issues or those kind of challenges we might have to overcome before we can use one contract for across different layers? Well, I mean, it's a new law, right? It's basically something we have to define, right? So obviously today people would look at it and uh, try to figure out if they could make it fit into existing laws of layering. and. Mm, probably not, I guess, right? But uh, what is technically wrong about it? And I think that's, uh, you know, where I would start from um, and look at the benefits of it um, and then uh, define a new law of layering. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So any more questions? Okay, if no, uh, appreciate for your work, uh, Torres. Uh, very thank you, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Okay, uh, hello all the uh, participants. Uh, this is all content for of session C, and uh, we will have session D uh, half hour later, uh, chaired by Philip de Turk. And thank you for your participant, uh, patient. And uh, if you have any more questions, please send email to me or to the uh, uh, speakers uh, in session C. Uh, I would like uh, I would like to also thanks for the work from Francisco for his or her uh, support for this meeting. Thank you. Okay. Bye. <laughs>